Greetings, Bill Mobley from the Brain Channel for UC TV. Um, talking today and in, in the next couple of sessions about a really important clinical problem, the problem of autism. It's a problem that affects very many families across the U.S. and in the world. Uh, recent estimates put the incidence of autism at one in 68 uh, newborn children. This is a disorder that has a huge impact on the way the infants and children interact with their parents, the world around them, and it really makes it difficult for them to live normally and to function normally. And this big problem is going to go away only if we understand the neurobiology of it. With me today is Allison Motri, Associate Professor in Pediatrics and Cell and Molecular Medicine, whose, whose work is very much focused on this problem That's here. and is making very interesting uh, observations and really part of a team here at UCSD that's uh, changing our thinking about autism. So, Allison, welcome. Great to have you. Tell us about yourself and your work. All right. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I am uh, a geneticist by training. I had my PhD in genetics by uh, the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, but I always wanted to apply that uh, to neurosciences. That's when I moved for a postdoc with Rusty Geisha at the Salk Institute here in San Diego, and um, starting using stem cells as a tool to really understand um, how the brain would be formed. And soon I decided to move into human embryonic stem cells uh, to have the human material so I could use those cells to produce as many human neurons as I would like. And uh, thinking that perhaps uh, there is a human perspective on the understanding of diseases that affect the social brain, such as autism. So uh, after that, I, I, I set up my lab, and it was about the time when Shina Yamanaka, who won uh, the Nobel Prize in, in 2012, have discovered that you can reprogram cells uh, from individuals, uh, from adult individuals, by pushing these cells back to this embryonic state. So by doing that, he was able to capture the entire genetic or, uh, or variations of the individual in this pluripotent state. And really from that stage, I could recapitulate uh, the neurodevelopment mm -hmm. in a dish. So my lab really takes advantage of this technology and um, we reprogram cells from individuals with autism and, and, and non-affected individuals and we compare. We do uh, a series of uh, molecular and cellular analysis to understand uh, what is the basics um, uh, uh, of the pathology uh, at these very early stages. So it's exciting to think that you can actually, if you will, wipe away the ravages of age in a cell and allow that cell to become now a neuron with a future that is very much predicated upon its genes. That's correct. So if there are genes in that cell that predispose to autism and they're active in that cell in your culture dish, now in a way you've created sort of a little autism culture in a dish. Yeah, and, and you're absolutely right. So by, by having this system in the lab, we can eliminate all the environmental factors that might or might not contribute to autism and focus really on the genetic predisposition of, of, of those kids. So we align this kind of cellular modeling uh, or disease in a dish um, with the genomic information from the patients. And then we start to identify what are the mutations that are really causal? What are the mutations that can really affect the way these neurons connect, the synapses are formed, the network develops. So this is what we do in the lab. So we combine the cellular modeling, the genomic information, and uh, what we call now genome editing to really prove causation that those mutations in, that, in those specific genes can lead to alterations at the cellular level. You know, I think a person uh, might ask the question, well, gosh, the brain is really complicated. Autism is probably really complicated. What can you see in a dish full of neurons that suggests to you that they're having the same problems, those neurons are, right. as they might have in a brain. Yeah, so this is one of the limitation of the system, is really the complexity that we cannot yet uh, recapitulate that in a dish. But these early stages that represents probably something similar to the first trimester of um, the human gestation, we already detect some, some alterations that um, are quite important. I mean, we see that uh, in most cases, neurons derived from autistic kids, they have a lower number of excitatory synapses. Mm. Uh, the morphology of those neurons is not as arborized or as mature as we would see with um, similar control cells. 
and uh, it all boils down to a defect in network activity. So we can grow these uh, networks on top of multi-electrode arrays and we can capture their uh, electrical activity over time. And as we do that and compare autism and non-autism, uh, we see that uh, these networks, they are quite um, immature in a way. They, uh, they start having like random uh, action potentials, some firing, some synchronization, um, but this network will never develop. In a control cell, we see that this actually develops over time, as they would do uh, probably in the human brain in uterus. You know, I think the general public won't really be aware of the importance of activity in developing brain circuits. So they'll know, for example, that neurons link together at synapses right. to form circuits. But it won't be so clear to the general public that actually neurons have an endogenous activatability, if you will, mm -hmm. and that that endogenous activatability helps build those circuits. So that whether you're in a dish or in the brain, the activity level is important for establishing those circuits. Right. And you can study that in a dish in a way that is revealing of what goes on in the brain. Right, right. So not only could you use this model really to understand this um, basic mechanisms that may lead to these uh, uh, alterations in these networks. But also another exciting part is to use this system to screen for potential drugs that may uh, interfere in one of those pathways and make these networks behave like normal or control networks or similar at least. So we have been exploring this idea of uh, establishing drug screening platforms. Because you can create unlimited number of neurons in a dish, you can actually screen thousands and thousands of drugs in, in, in a couple of months. So this is something that we never thought would be possible. I mean, it's certainly difficult to do that uh, with a good mouse model. But uh, with those neurons in a dish, you can screen like thousands of drugs. Mm. And, um, and perhaps finding some of them that could, uh, uh, we could understand better the mechanism and move uh, quite quickly uh, into a clinical trial. So what would be the steps that would intervene between looking at neurons at a dish, finding a small molecule, and then doing a clinical trial? Would you have to go to mouse models of autism to make sure that the drugs worked? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, it will really depend on the model of autism we have. There are subtypes of autism. Some of them, the genes or the genetic, uh, is very well uh, defined, and we have great mouse models. Uh, in others, there is a multiple hit or the genetic background, and we, it's kind of responsible for, uh, for the autism, but we don't really understand how the genes play together. So creating mouse models for those subtypes would be difficult. And then there is a second um, question, what if you could rescue or revert the autism in a dish, but not in the mouse model? What does it tell about the drug? Will, is it species specific? Uh, will really work in vivo? So these are very new uh, uh, to us as well. So we haven't done that yet, uh, but we are excited to discuss this possibility. I can see that uh, the best candidates would be the ones that we can revert the phenotypes in a dish, it will work well in a mouse model, and then uh, these would be the top candidates to move into clinical trials. And just as one has issues with seeing what neurons are doing in a dish that's relevant to autism, in the mouse or the rodent, you have questions as well as to what, is, what does autism look like in a mouse or right. a rat. Um, I think we're at an early stage of understanding that as well, are we not? Yeah, yeah. And especially when you move to the core of autism symptoms, such as social communication or, or human language, these are hard questions to model in a, in a mouse model. So uh, I, I would say that each model has a limitation, but when you combine them together and you see that the same thing is true in different models, that gives you a level of confidence that what you have is true. We've heard a little bit about the future of autism in this short segment. Speak more about that. What do you anticipate happening in the next 5, 10, 20 years with the study and the treatment of autism? I think overall uh, one can see that perhaps autism uh, will reach to a point where it would become just a symptom 
and not like a disease or, 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 or a group of syndromes together. But we're going to really identify the different causative genes in different subgroups. And those would be a group of rare disorders that will have their own characteristics and will be no longer called autism. So I, I can see that maybe the genomic information will tell us that these are a group of different diseases similar to what we see in cancer. It's not a single type of cancer, but there are different types of cancers. Uh, so that's one possibility. The other possibility is that independently or, of how the genes, uh, uh, the mutations in the genes, they all converge to similar pathways. So it would be a, a pathway disorder, and we're going to try to understand how these pathways are affected um, uh, coming from the different types of mutations. In the end, if, if you found a way to help kids relate more naturally to their parents and their friends, uh, but didn't really know the molecular basis for that. Would that feel all right to you? Yes, absolutely. Because yeah. in the end, it's the, it's the person that we're trying to help. Yeah, yeah. But I would say that most of us at this place called UCSD believe that molecules are important and that understanding the molecules are, are likely to help us understand the underlying disorder. Yeah, yeah. So the work is exciting. What's, what's right ahead for you? What do your next studies look like? Right, I think what's cooking in the lab is better protocols to, to make these um, neurons in a dish more sophisticated. So we are moving to models where we can really create three-dimensional structures that represent uh, a simplistic view of uh, the human cortex with different layers, with some kind of um, cortical organization that we barely see in a two-dimensional model. So we think that um, with these uh, type of organoids that we create in a dish, we will be able to reconstruct uh, specific circuitries uh, that are important for autism and perhaps other neurological disorders. And, and that will tell us more uh, with a different level of um, sophistication what's wrong at the circuitry level. And using human cells. And using human cells, yeah. Which is such a huge advantage. Right. Great to have you on the program. Best wishes. Go out and do great work for us. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank Fingers you. crossed. <laughs> and thanks from the Brain Channel and Bill Mobley for UCSD.